Hey -o, everybody! Welcome to High Side, Low Side. This is Zach Quartz coming at you live from the room next to my garage. And I'm here, as always, with Mr. Spurgeon Dunbar. Hello, Zachary. It is a lovely Friday afternoon when we're recording this. I'm hopped up on caffeine. Hopefully your <laughs> day's going as energetic as mine is. Absolutely. I went from being too cold in the room next to my garage to too warm in the room next to my garage in about three weeks. As we all know, Southern California weather is very fickle. Anyway. It's that time um, of year, though. It is the springtime, <laughs> where one it day is. it's 40 degrees and the next day it's 80. <laughs> it's true. So, uh, today's agenda, as you well know, we will give away a t-shirt, we'll talk about the news. Um, we have our lovely friend Spencer Robert on the program today, and the topic is, as you probably know, are motorcycles the cheapest way to get around? So we're going we're gonna to dive into what the heck we're talking about there eventually. Um, and then after that, of course, we'll answer some um, viewer, listener, comments, and questions, which is uh, arguably... I have to check with my lawyer, but I think that's the favorite part of my show. Really? Yeah, I think so. First things first, though. Um, speaking of lawyers, <laughs> uh, we need to give a, a tip of the cap to our uh, our benevolent sponsor, Motul. <laughs> like that the the lawyers came into play there. Otherwise, this con the, the, like the contract negotiation is going to go horribly exactly. awry. Everything everything's fine with Motul, yeah. by the way. For the for the for our listeners out there, Motul uh, is very easy to work with. We don't need to get the lawyers involved <laughs> usually. Um, but talking about Motul, I think it's important to note that uh, one of the things that we try to do is incorporate Motul in, in some of the live uh, action performance things that we do. Um, <laughs> and one of the bigger live action performance things that we do uh, this year, especially, is get on Adventure Fest. And yes. the way that we gave back to our audience and our listeners last year in the Black Hills of South Dakota was we, we set up a little tent, and every day when you came back in from riding off-road, we had some Motul chain cleaner and some Motul off-road chain lube. Now, for you BMW shaft guys, you have no <laughs> need for that, but for everybody else out there riding a, a, an adventure bike that is not a shaft drive bike, uh, we had a little sta station set up with Motul and we were uh, cleaning chains and lubing chains for everybody out there. And if you didn't Kissing know how to do it yourself, and even, chains. yeah, we, we did it for you. In some cases, I had Brandon <laughs> get down on the ground and uh, <laughs> lube my chain just because it was easier to have him do it than, you know, use my knees. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fair enough. So uh, if you are headed to Sturgis for the second of our Get On Adventure Fests this Oops. year, uh, then uh, get ready to get mo tooled. And if, if you're. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I gotta work that into one of the ads. <laughs> I was just gonna say, if if you don't know what, you're, what we're talking about, um, if you are an adventure rider out there, or if you're a street rider that just wants to go on a, a three day scenic street tour, uh, there is a little bit of something for everyone, uh, especially in the the Sturgis location. Uh, mm. Really great riding for both on road and off road. You can check out uh, Revzilla.com slash fest to read all about what we're talking about with Get on Adventure Fest. That's revzilla.com slash fest. Kids eat just we, five bucks. Are we going to get into the uh, NPR voice? <laughs> uh, let's get into giving away a t-shirt, shall we? I think that's much too more many, exciting than getting into NPR voices. GD t-shirts around here anyway. So uh, as a friendly reminder, if you leave a review on our Apple podcast page, we will pick one uh, at random, sort of. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, and we'll by pick random, one we, we like. mean one that we like. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, we will ask that you send us your uh, t-shirt size and mailing address so that we can send you a free t-shirt. This episode's winner, Spurgeon Dunbar. Mid-Coast Scramble uh, wrote in and <laughs> said, or Mid-Coast Scram Scrambler, Scrambler, Scrambler yeah. Scramble would be like, you know, he's having some eggs for breakfast. Mid-Coast right. Scrambler says, I am a firefighter slash paramedic just getting into riding at age 40. Um, so one year older than Zach and myself. And don't act like you're 38 because <laughs> you're going to be 39 soon enough. Um, Zach, your uh, <laughs> podcast has been exactly what I need uh, for baseline knowledge. I appreciate the balance of gents, uh, the balance that you gents strike between embracing the calculated risk inherent uh, 
adve- adventures of riding a motorcycle and then providing encouragement to ride defensively, wear protective gear, and continue taking classes to progress skills. Uh, look forward in, look forward to each new episode. Keep it up, guys. Um, and we just we like this one because I think I think it's important to note that there is a balance, right, between mm-hmm. you know riding a motorcycle and, and some of the the things you can do to help you know fight against the risks associated with riding a motorcycle. Indeed. Yeah, we like this one for a lot of reasons. Uh, uh, the flattery, obviously, but also um, the fact that, um, you know, a, a firefighter, a, a paramedic is sort of raising uh, their hand and saying, hey, you know, like I'm riding motorcycles and I understand the risk of it. Also, getting into riding age 40, love that, um, you know, uh, later than uh, than Spurge and I did, obviously, um, but we love to, you love to see it regardless. And of course, uh, you know, if, if you can be rocking a high side, low side t-shirt around the station here and there, well, we wouldn't hate that either, just to be associated with anyone who whose job it is to help people and put out fires. There you go. There yeah. you go. So, uh, Mid Coast Scrambler, please do send us your preferred t-shirt size and mailing address to highside, lowside at revzilla.com, and we will send you a t-shirt. Same thing goes for all previous winners. If you've won in a previous episode and you've yet to send us your email address with t-shirt mm-hmm. information, go ahead and do that, um, and we will get you a t-shirt sent out as well. Now let's move on to the news. And the first note here, and I actually, I went through and I read a couple different articles on this, but the ex-Norton CEO, Stuart mm. Gardner, has been Garner. sent... Gardner. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> I feel like this is the Stewie and Brian Cool Whip thing from Family Guy. I, you, I think you said, it sounded like you said Gardner. No, no, Gardner. Gardner. No, there's no D. <laughs> Gardner. Right, Gardner. G-A-R-N-E-R. Gardner. <laughs> what did I say? I don't know. Anyway, uh, Stuart Garner has been sentenced. Uh, For those of you that are not aware, he did plead guilty to three charges of breaching pension regulations and illegally investing up to an approximately 11 million pounds of people's pension money and then basically funneling that off into Norton motorcycles. So big deal here. This has been a, it's just been sort of like a tabloid motorcycle. So like if there were motorcycle tabloids, aren't there? I don't, not really, whatever. If there were, this would be splashed all over the front page because it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's the motorcycling version of like free Britney. I think it's just, it like it, people love to, they love the drama of it and everything. And I think the real, the real message here, the real news is, um, is that Norton motorcycles has in the past number of years to a certain extent had, some motorcycles that were intriguing and interesting and cool. And, uh, they went to Isle of Man and I don't know. And, and it's just a shame to see it all kind of like crumble in a very sort of public and shameful way. Well, here's the problem that I have with this. And, uh, and I was, uh-huh. I was trying to get logged in here so I could pull this up. Um, the punishment doesn't necessarily fit the crime, right? So he, he basically embezzled, uh, up to 11 million pounds of, of other people's money, um, he was ordered to, I think he was sentenced to eight months in prison, but it was a stayed, it was a stayed order, which means that basically as long as he doesn't get in trouble, he doesn't have to go to prison. Um, and <clears throat> his fine was like 21,000 pounds or it wasn't even a fine. He had to pay like 21,000 pounds in costs. So the other part of this is that most of that will probably go on paid because he filed for bankruptcy. So embezzles 11 million pounds, gets hit with an eight-month sentence, doesn't actually have to go to jail for that, can just sit at home, and as long as he you know, behaves himself, he's fine. He gets asked to pay $21,000 in court costs, says that he can't pay it because he filed for bankruptcy, and then the court's like, well, I guess we can't make him do that. So the court... The taxpayer is going to end up eating that cost in, I'm assuming they pay taxes in London, right? Isn't that what we left for back in 1776 to escape the taxes? So I'm just, it seems like, it seems like this guy really uh, didn't end up with a punishment that fit the crime of the money that he took. So, yeah. 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 It's true. You have been sentenced to no tea and sandwiches with the vicar for three years. (laughs) The vicar. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, it's yeah, it's 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 a bummer. It's a bummer, is what it is. And we just wanted you guys to know about the bummer, not because we like sharing bummers, but because we want you to be flipping informed. And I think that's enough about Stuart Gardner's name. Gardner. 
Not Gardner. <laughs> Don't say it wrong. All right. Give us one that's more exciting, Zach. Yes. Um, there was a story trickling around the internet recently, which if, you're, uh, if you use the internet, you may have seen this before, <laughs> before we're telling you. But BMW uh, sort of seemed to have leaked um, a tip on the R1300 GS um, and something called an M1300 GS. Ooh. Yeah, that sounds like it's got Spurgeon Dunbar written all over it. I don't think so. I'm a more no? mid-displacement guy these days, Zach, oh, in my that's... older age. Yeah. Right, you have lost weight, I forgot. Yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep it moving. So, keep it moving. Sorry. Here. Um, so there's there's also been there's also a, a R1400 GSTs. Now for those of you that are listening and not sure what we're talking about, the current flagship adventure bike in BMW's line is the R1250 GS. This is actually a press launch that Zach and I both attended. Uh, what was it four years ago now? Three years ago now? How the time flies, man! Crazy. Uh, out in Palm Springs. And that, that's a bike that basically they, they changed some things around to meet emission standards. They upped the displacement from a 1200 to a 1250. And really, th there's not too much information on these at the moment. Obviously, there is a displacement bump. But I would imagine that along with the displacement bump, we're also going to see some other technology come along with this. Do you have any idea what the M1300 is? This is going to be like their new like sport, like more aggressive adventure bike, right? Yeah, I, that, that was the suggestion, I believe. Because that's what I they're doing with their the whole year. their whole M line, right? <laughs> no, because like, um, right? It's the high performance. It's like the cars. Yeah. They're using the M badge as like a sort of like the high performance. So they used to do HP. Yep. Um, so if you remember any BMWs from back in the day that were the the um, HP there was an HP two. two. Yeah, there were a couple of HP twos, and of course there was HP four, um, and HP four kind of in some ways became the M one thousand double R. So I think that's kind of where they're going with this, instead of there being uh, HP two. GS version or something like that in the future it would be an M1300 GS so uh, yeah anyway uh, it, it, not a huge surprise because this is what a lot of companies are doing they're making the engines a little bit bigger in their vehicles to in order to maintain the same amount of horsepower with new emissions regulations and that type of thing so it's uh, not a huge surprise but but uh, kind of fun to see like a little peek behind the curtain or four, four years from curtain. now we'll be coming to you <laughs> with information that BMW's leaked uh, the R1800, and it'll just keep going from there. Uh, wow. So, yeah. yeah you we'll never see. know. We'll see. You never know. Okie doke. Last story of the news. Let's get through it. We can do it. Yamaha is developing electric power steering for motorcycles. So Wait, hold on, Spurgeon. Electric power steering on a motorcycle? Are motorcycles even that hard to steer? That's a great question, Zach. Uh, the idea that it seems that is being developed here is that Yamaha is introducing uh, a power steering hub that sits around the uh, the actual steering stem. And the idea, from what I can understand, is much like motorcycles use steering dampers to, to slow down the steering, uh, especially in off-road or in racing situations when the handlebars get a little bit wiggly on you, um, that they can do this electronically now. We have seen, if I remember correctly... There are certain manufacturers that have electronic steering dampers. Um, yes. I believe Kawasaki, off the top of my head, maybe I'm wrong on that, but I thought that I read somewhere that Kawasaki was using electronic steering dampers. Um, the I know Honda does. Uh, Honda had that Honda? Had on okay. a CBR 1000 for I don't know 10 years, a long time. Maybe that's what I'm, maybe that's what I'm thinking of. But essentially, from what I was able to see from some of the drawings here, um, it looks like Yamaha is testing this on some of their motocross bikes. And it looks like a very similar concept to that. Like the computer can tell when it needs a little bit more damping or when it doesn't. Right. That's kind of what the sense is that I'm getting. Yeah, it does seem like they could do, you could sort of damp the steering and assist if if necessary. And I know it sounds weird to have any kind of assistance. This, these are for motocross. This is a motocross application, I think, initially, right? That's what Yamaha's testing initially, is Initially, yes. Not, yeah. So... I know it sounds weird to have motorcycle power steering because we all think like, oh, well, if your ha bike handles properly or if you have a you know a good handling bike, then you don't really have to worry about that. And I think that that's true to a certain extent. But I will say, you know, if you remember, I don't know, like, uh, what's a good example? High definition TV. I think there were lots of people that thought, I don't need HD TV. Like, whatever, it's fine. I, I can see the sports. I can see the what's going on. I don't need. And then you see high definition TV and you're like, oh, wow, that's actually quite a bit better. I didn't realize how much better it was. And I think that, there could be one of those, you know, if you're very skeptical about this, it's possible that you try it and be like, oh, wow, that's actually pretty good. So I'm, I've got an open mind, even though I'm a little confused, but, or not, not confused, but uh, skeptical, maybe. 
Yeah, I think it's just a different approach to a, to solving a problem that you know people have been trying to solve for a while. And you know, obviously, there's a reason that the, there's a reason that steering dampers exist, especially in you know high performance applications. So it's interesting to see that Yamaha is putting this into place, um, yeah. and it'll be interesting to see how it trickles down, you know, from their top tier performance off road machines to other bikes in the lineup and, and what that could mean. So um, yeah, that's that's going to wrap up the news for today, yeah. and I believe we yeah. can now get onto the meat and potatoes, which is the discussion with Spencer Robert. And for those of you that forgot, because we've been talking for 20 minutes about the news, <laughs> the topic today is, are motorcycles the cheapest way to get around? So why not bring on RevZilla's, you know, resident cheapskate to help us discuss this? <laughs> Let's do it. Well, we've got Spencer on the podcast now. I want to just apologize for my earlier comments where I called him a cheapskate. Uh, he reminded us uh, in pre-production that he likes to be called frugal. So Spencer, I apologize for that. Yeah, don't you know you, you can't you can't blame me for wanting a good deal, all right? It's not a crime. <laughs> I think it's worth noting that whenever we have to negotiate buying bikes for a CTXP episode or other uh, Revzilla endeavors, we send Spencer because he is quite the negotiator. So and and nothing flatters me more than when the internet uh, comments and says there is no way you could have gotten a bike for that price, and I'm like, go on, <laughs> <laughs> tell me more. Prettiest girl at the dance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, on the topic of price, the topic for this episode is, are, the motor are motorcycles the cheapest way to get around, which is very broad. I think we can all agree. The reason that we came to this um, is the uh, gas prices have gone up recently. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this podcast isn't wildly out of date when you're listening to it. Um, but gas prices where Spencer and I live here in Southern California are approximately $6 a gallon. And that always brings up this conversation of of motorcycles and motor scooters and alternate uh, alternate modes of transportation right like how how else can you get around and how can you get better gas mileage and spurgeon the other day in a meeting was saying oh you know i I'm, i should write an article about how like it's kind of a fallacy the whole like motorcycles are cheaper i don't even know and then we got arguing about it and then we thought hey well, let's save this argument and do it in public because what's more fun than that is that accurate spurge absolutely and uh you know so there is there is a common trade article up right now that andy greaser wrote about mm -hmm. fuel-efficient motorcycles and, and, and top fuel-efficient motorcycles and categories. I think that's going to play into some of the things that we're talking about here. And then also, just so, because uh, anytime we say something, there's always someone in the audience that's like, oh, well, I don't live in Southern California, and here in Iowa, Dubuque, it's a lot <laughs> more affordable for gas. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'll just say, you know, the counterpoint to that is here in Pennsylvania this morning, um, I paid four twenty eight a gallon. I actually made Ugh. a little note uh, as I was coming in. So Giving while that's away. more affordable than what you two knuckleheads are dealing with, I will say <laughs> that's over 100% higher than what I was paying last year at this time. So I think right. everybody can agree that like gas prices are pretty crazy right now. So should Spurgeon get a scooter? That's the topic for today. <laughs> Or do I just <laughs> hey Spencer? Do you still have a Do you still have a Honda Shadow for sale behind you? I mean, can I make or, you an offer on that? Or or the Battle Toad, which oh, yeah. you know has got that good versus fuel economy. There you and go. I, I, I this is this is very interesting that Spurgeon the the conversation came up, and you're like, oh, it's all a fallacy because one thing that Zach has said for many years um, is that the I think the sort of like. Uh, motorcycle anarchist in, in him has been like, I wish gas prices were $8 a gallon because then everyone would ride motorcycles. You know, it's sort of like, just keep letting gas prices get higher so that everybody <laughs> rides motorcycles and then obviously the world would be a better place if we're all on two wheels. <laughs> well, so I, I'm curious to see where this goes. Well, no, I think my point was <laughs> that, you know, looking at MPGs is, is one is one aspect of of trying to figure out the math on this, right? But there's a lot of other costs that get associated with motorcycles that you know automobiles don't necessarily have or might not have in the same regularity as motorcycles do. So I, I think my point was, you know, talking about gas prices is something, um, but then also just looking at some of the other costs associated with motorcycling in general. Um, and, and I think really the other part of this is like looking at costs for internal combustion cars, electric cars, public transportation, uh, mm -hmm. electric motorcycles, scooters, bicycles, like there's there's all different ways to get around, some of which are more practical than others. And I think that comes into play too. Like if you're commuting a mile to your office, then maybe an electric bicycle is is the easiest way for you to get along. Um, or, but, or maybe just walk, you lazy yeah. son of a gun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, but what, anyway, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, what's, I, I, Zach, as you, uh, well, as you and Spurgeon pointed out, this is a very big question. Yes. What is the, like, small piece that yeah. you can break well, so, off? So what Spurgeon just went through, all of what Spurgeon just said, all of that and more or less to come here on High Side, Low Side. But we're going to break this down into some, into some categories. And we're going to try and talk about them 
uh, piecemeal and then circle back to the to the main question because it is such a broad thing. So the first question that I'd like to pose uh, to you, Jelly Spoons, is are motorcycles cheaper from an upfront perspective? You want to buy a vehicle. You're a person with some money. You want to purchase a a vehicle to get to work, to get to your mother's house, whatever you're trying to do. This is the question that we have to answer. And I feel like in general, can you think of a, I mean, more expensive cars are more expensive than expensive motorcycles, brand new on a showroom floor. But if you're buying used or you're buying, or you're, or you're being, you're sort of like, uh, being a, being a sort of a, 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 um, a discerning buyer of vehicles, nice. you can, <laughs> you can, Frugal. you can arguably say that you can get them for the same price. Right. Ish. No? I feel like the only like the only answer writ large to this question is motorcycles are cheaper than cars up front. Like you can I think you can dive into the the sort of semantics of like, well, if you you know, if you found this whatever, uh, 1992 Econo box with 500,000 miles and a right. massive oil leak, you can buy it for $250 and that's cheaper than whatever some Eight hundred dollar, you know, uh, POS uh, versus six fifty battle toad thing that you picked up. So, like, I think it is theoretically possible that you could get a car for yeah. the same price as a motorcycle. But by and large, I think upfront cost is pretty agreed upon. Motorcycles are cheaper than cars. Yeah, I but think. What about? If, I wanted to just ahead. say, yeah, if we let's just focus on. And again, at the time of recording this, prices are bananas for used and new vehicles of all makes yep. and shapes. Uh, but let's just say we take a look at. A brand new Z400, which is an entry level motorcycle, which is roughly going to cost you around 5,500 bucks, said and done, fees, taxes, et cetera, yada, 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 maybe more depending on where you're t- paying taxes on. And a, a brand new Honda Civic, right? A Honda which Civic is like now is like $35,000. It's over $30,000 for a Honda Civic. It's insane. <laughs> so, like, even if we're just looking at that direct comparison of a brand new MSRP right. versus a brand new MSRP, Kawasaki versus Honda, and we could, if we really wanted to make it fair, we could grab a Honda motorcycle and do that comparison. But, like, you, there's a $25,000 difference there. I mean, I, so I looked up what is the cheapest, basically, what I, what I wanted to see is what is the cheapest highway legal major manufacturer motorcycle and the cheapest brand new car you can buy and the you know the highway legal major manufacturer motorcycle thing like it gets a little bit muddy but basically you're looking at about five thousand dollars like somewhere in that neck of the woods you can probably get a brand new five to fifty five hundred uh you can get a brand new highway capable motorcycle that can take you wherever you need to go the cheapest for 2022 car that i was able to find is a chevy spark which uh, has an MSRP of about $14,600, which is like pretty cheap for a brand new car in 2022. Yeah. Sure. But when you think about it from the upfront cost, even if, if you were an alien that landed on Earth and you were given some cold hard cash and, and your alien overlords were like, all right, you got to get around for the next year and you need to spend the least amount of money, there's still no way the car is cheaper. Like you have to, you, you could buy all of your motorcycle gear, your motorcycle, take an MSF course and still have money left over if you're looking at the cheapest, absolute cheapest car you can get in 2022 is about mm-hmm. 15 grand. Yeah. And, and we, so, we, we, we so, did this too, just so we're clear when we're talking about those added costs. Um, and, and just so the audience is clear, we are talking about upfront costs, costs that you have to pay immediately. We're not talking about long term, which we'll get into here in a minute. But you know, we, we, we get this question a lot around gear. And I think we did the math on this and we tried to go through and figure out like a base price for like if you're just starting off a, a, a quality helmet, quality jacket, quality gloves, quality boots, quality riding jeans, you're gonna spend roughly a thousand dollars. Um, a thousand to twelve hundred dollars. So we're we're trying to acknowledge the fact that like there is a cost associated with this. The other part of this too is insurance costs, and I think that there's definitely a difference in insurance costs. Zach hold saying, on, "Hold on, out. hold on, you're getting, you're getting way ahead of me. We got to pump the brakes. We're not talking about insurance yet. We're just talking about upfront costs." But that's costs. an upfront, that's an upfront cost. You have to have insurance when you buy the vehicle. Well, arguably, you also have to have tires. <laughs> but like tire to. tire replacement is, I, I think that falls under is maintenance. A, well, but you have to maintain I, your insurance, do you not? I, I think oh, I think to that point, insurance insurance is kind of a can of worms that we should probably talk about separately. Yes, I agree. But so it is, I, I'm it not is done with point. the upfront cost thing yet. I think what you said about gear makes sense. However, I would like to circle back for just a moment because if you say fifty five hundred dollars, say you have fifty five hundred dollars to spend on a vehicle, you can get 
a good motorcycle for that money. You can get a new motorcycle for that money, as you both pointed out. You can also get a used motorcycle for $5,500 that will work pretty well. A $5,500 used motorcycle will be pretty good in general. And I like, what about a $5,500 used car? They're harder. What's that supposed to mean? I'm I, I think currently it's, I basically think I, using a $5,500 used car, <laughs> and like it's pretty good, and it gets better gas mileage than a motorcycle, and whatever. The point is, that's that's feasible, is it not? It, it is. I just think the used thing is so is, is so difficult. Like you you just go down this rabbit hole of being like, well, it is possible, and depending on your market and depending on the specific vehicle, like can you get a used car for the same price as a motorcycle? Probably. But right. I just think okay. if you had to average it out, if you had to take every single used car and every single used motorcycle and average out the upfront certainly. cost, I just think certainly, certainly, certainly. Sim- certainly. From a simplicity sake, I still maintain bikes are cheaper up front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I do think I just would like to add the caveat that if you're talking about buying a used motorcycle and spending a thousand dollars on gear, whatever bike you buy, there is probably a commensurate automobile that is. That is for sale for approximately that price, and we should not ignore that. Is all I'm I would just yeah. say that when you get into the range, I think that what you have to remind yourself is that if you're buying a five thousand dollar used car, it's Careful. most it's it's no I I've <laughs> up until up until my my Toyota Tacoma I never spent more than I I've, I've I've owned a lot of cheap cars, <laughs> but but my point is is that. Uh, out of all the cheap cars I've owned, they, they typically have some things that need to be fixed on them, or they typically need some uh-huh. work, or uh-huh. they're not necessarily right. you know right. perfect right out of the box. And there usually is some additional costs that get associated with that. Yes. Um, and, and that's the one well, thing that I want to. I mean, you're talking about a much bigger depreciation going from a five thousand dollar used motorcycle that might be depreciated a couple thousand dollars versus a five thousand dollar car that's fifteen years old that depreciated, you know, eighty percent of its value. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that, yeah. I, I think I, I think I think we can agree that I'm also right. The point is, this is a great segue <laughs> to uh, the maintenance cost that you just brought up. If you if you if you were for hypothetically, well, to get a new car or a used car or used motorcycle, whatever. Well, um, wait before you move on to maintenance costs. As long as we're still talking about upfront costs, <laughs> I do think that one of the one of the things that automobiles have in favor is economy of scale. And what I mean by that is that if you are financing your vehicle. There are a lot more opportunities to get zero percent financing on an automobile than there are on motorcycles. So, you know, you could take you could take that fourteen thousand, fifteen thousand dollar spark and get zero percent financing on it, and basically that's free money over the course of the loan, versus something where motorcycles typically you're gonna you're gonna get hit with a finance charge. If okay, you pay so for that. what would the APR have to be on a Ninja <laughs> 400 or sorry a, a Z400 in order for a Z400 to actually end up costing fourteen thousand dollars over the life of the loan? Uh, like uh, I'm just kidding. Don't answer that question. Yes. Holy crap, we're so far <laughs> off track. The point is, yes, that's true. Economy of scale, zero percent financing. Okay, but I think it's better to just talk MSRP and chunks of money because that's so much easier to uh, map for me anyway. Maybe it's just that I'm not good at math. But I do think that we should move on to to maintenance costs. I think. Do, do you dispute uh, uh, Spencer's claim, guest honors, that motorcycles are cheaper than cars from an upfront cost perspective? Period. Spurgeon. No, I uh, do. I no. I, I, I'm, I'm in agreeing. I'm agreeing with you're, him. You're, you're the one that's disagreeing with him. Don't just don't turn me against a, him. I'm with him. No, no. I, yeah. So I I push comes to shove. Yes. I agree as well. Um, I just think that we should remember that uh, cheap cars aren't so bad or they can work. But I think that's a good segue, again, for maintenance costs and what you end up spending on the, the vehicle. And this is, a, this is a pretty, broadly, this is an easy thing to, to chew over, right? We're talking about when you have to put tires on a motorcycle, the insurance that Spurgeon was talking about, um, stuff like that. So what's, what's, your, what's your kind of gut instinct, Spencer, on, on that front? Well, uh, I think the baseline here is, are you maintaining the vehicles the way you should be? Because if you just ignore the maintenance, then, uh, which of course we would never recommend, um, then I think, you know, that can tweak. I, and the reason I, I'm, a part of me is, of course, joking, but part of me is also being a little bit serious in that if you go absolutely by the book of your recommended maintenance for vehicles, which I think most people this side of Ari Henning do not do when it's like after three years, replace your radiator hose. Like, I don't, I don't know how far down the rabbit hole people are going with that sort of thing, right. but right. it, it does seem like 
in general, motorcycle maintenance is likely to be higher. You, it, it's just that I think motorcycles themselves are a little bit more consumable. So, you know, whether it's your, your tires or your chain or, yep. you know, the frequency of oil changes or spark plugs or, you know, brake pads, whatever it might be, things just wear out faster on motorcycles. And mm -hmm going back to the economies of scale thing, yes. I think given the the size of the materials involved, motorcycle components uh, and maintenance is more expensive. You know, like motorcycle tires can be just yep. as expensive, if not more expensive than car tires, even though they only last, you know, a sixth of the amount of time. So right. that's that's where the, the math starts to, to sort of, I think, level out. And the, and the question gets a little bit more complicated. Yeah. Spurge? Thoughts? No, what about you, Zach? You go. You go next. I don't have any thoughts. No, I think actually what what um, what Spencer said is exactly what I was going to talk. What I was going to say as well, which is that the economy of scale thing makes a big difference, and it's very common for car tires to be so much cheaper than <laughs> than motorcycle tires and last so much longer. Uh, it just yeah, and for a bunch of reasons, not least of which they make so many more of them. <laughs> Um, I think as far as the, the maintenance schedule to sort of address something that you, you posed as sort of a question, Spencer, I, you know, yeah, something like replacing the radiator hose after every three years or whatever is a, I, I in my head, I think it's mostly like, um, drivetrain consumables. So chains and sprockets if, if applicable and then tires and brake pads and like, you know, uh, oil coolant, that kind of thing. Um, but certainly I, and, I, and I wonder, this is this is a little bit of a tangent, but I'm curious what you guys think. Do you think motorcycle maintenance is more expensive? It's certainly more expensive because they, like tires wear out faster. That's just a fact uh, on average. But isn't motorcycle maintenance probably expensive because of the cultural aspect of it? Like, don't you think there are people that maintain their motorcycles or upgrade them or do things to them sort of because it's a thing that you do when you have a motorcycle, you, you know, you, you spend money on your motorcycle to, to make it better, to maintain it, to like, Oh yeah. Like I should, I'm going to do a chain and sprockets and like, I'm not sure or, if it's time, but I want a yeah, new chain. Or, or I'm on a, a Z 400 and I need high end sport touring tires because I am slaying these canyons. Well, <laughs> so I, I want to say that I do think what I, what I try to do when I was figuring out the, the mental math on this was, was put some of that to the, to the, to the wayside, right? Like if you're putting on, an anodized gold handlebar just because you want to have some bling on your bike. Like I'm not counting that as a maintenance cost, but <laughs> fair, fair. But to Spencer's point, like I don't think that putting on high performance sport touring tires is necessarily a bad modification on a Z400. And, and this oh. was part of the, this is part of the math that I was doing. Um, you know, if you put on something like GPR 300s and you're getting 5,000 miles out of them, or you put on a set of the new Michelin pilot sixes, or the road sixes rather, and you're getting 25,000 miles out of them, you're actually saving money in the long run. So you're paying twice the amount of money for the tires, but you're paying for one tire change versus four to five tire changes on on the, the cheaper tires. And I think this is something that gets confused uh, often when people are looking at the price of a good. Um, and Ari actually touched on this in his Sport Touring Tires article. Um, but you know, a four hundred dollar set of sport touring tires versus a two hundred dollar set of GPR three hundreds, you're going to end up paying multiple, multiple times for more tires and more tire changes. So you're going to end up paying probably close to a thousand dollars or twelve hundred dollars for those cheaper tires by the time you wear out that first set of tires. So I think, mm. you know, especially what I was trying to do when I was putting the math together on this is focus on tires first and foremost as a as a cost for this. Yeah. yeah, I also think yeah. one thing that comes to mind for me, and again, I was kind of making jokes about people putting super high-end tires on relatively inexpensive or not necessarily super high-performance bikes, but if I had to roll the dice on very inexpensive tires in a car versus a motorcycle, I am much more likely to put probably <laughs> cheaper tires uh, on a car. And like, it, ah, you know, true. in general, you probably shouldn't do it either way, but it's just like, if I had to, I am a lot more concerned about my traction when I only have two wheels than I do when I have four wheels. And either way, I live in Southern California, so it's not a huge deal, but you know, it just, <laughs> I, I feel like, I feel like there are things that you're just less likely to want to play with from a, a cost perspective on a motorcycle because you are so much more exposed. Well, yeah, yeah I, I just want to, yeah, kind of finishing up on the, the tires part of this. And I think it's a good note for a lot of people out there. Um, I, I think at times we sometimes 
people in general, not us, not you know, taking us out of the equation. <laughs> Sometimes people will look at cost and they'll think, oh, two things. Either that cost is inflated and I'm just going to get the cheap ones and they're just as good. Or, oh, I'm going to go buy the expensive thing because it's probably better. And there's two different ways that people look at costs. What I have found, historically speaking, is that you know, with tires, oftentimes if you spend a little bit more money, you can get a little bit more life out of them, you know, at least on the, the car side of things. I think with motorcycles, it's important to note that sometimes you're spending more money to get less life, but better performance out of them. And what, you know, for this particular episode, when we're talking about how to, how to, you know, be a bit more frugal with the things that you're doing to your motorcycle to get more life out of it for less money, it's not about spending more tire, more money on tires. It's about putting the right tires on for the application. And something like a, a set of Pilot, um, you know, Pilot Fives or Pilot Sixes might be less than a high performance tire. They might cost you more than a budget tire, but that's going to be the right tire for a lot of people that are doing, you know, canyon carving, street riding, or whatever, um, because it's going to give you better mileage and and performance. Um, so just something to just something to talk about there, because I think oftentimes we forget about the intention, and, and especially with motorcycle tires more so than with cars. You know, what is your intention that you're buying the tires for? The intention yeah. is saving money. <laughs> for the sake of this podcast, certainly. And yeah, for what it's worth, I think if I'm reading between the lines, Spencer, when you said high performance sport touring tires on a Kawasaki Z400, I think what you meant was like hyper sport, like racing tires, right? That's yeah. You you were talking about like putting ultra high spec like race rubber on a bike that realistically is not going to the track or the rider is not utilizing all of that performance and therefore basically you were being with Spurge in in the long run I I, yeah and I actually want to ask you Zach because you lived with only a motorcycle I'm gonna put you on the spot here and I don't know if you're gonna know the answer to this but you lived with only a motorcycle for for how long as your only mode of transportation other than Uh, friends and public transportation until I was 31 years old (laughs) (laughs) uh what was so when I got my license? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, like realistically, ten well, years, and I, fifteen years. And maybe let's take your your KTM of of daily rider fame. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think you have a lot of maintenance costs right now, probably mostly because it uh, doesn't get ridden very often because mm-hmm. you're riding all these other bikes. But mm-hmm. like, what a year of riding that bike as your only transportation. Do you have any memory? Like, do, do you remember feeling sort of like, uh, you, you know, uh, like your wallet was getting pinched by how much maintenance you were constantly having to do? Or was it not that bad? Do you remember? I'm curious what that experience was like. Um, yeah, well, I, I want to wait to touch on one of these items till the very end. Um, so if you remember, please bring this back up. Uh, but um, certainly I chewed through tires, definitely. Um, and I didn't log a ton of miles either. I mean, I lived in San Francisco, which for those not familiar, <laughs> is a city in California that is seven miles by seven miles. That's the size of the entire city. So it, you really don't go that far ever within the confines of San Francisco. And of course, I rode my bike elsewhere outside San Francisco, but I, I lived and worked in the city. So I commuted back and forth. Realistically, it wasn't that far. But yeah, I do remember changing tires You know, a heck of a lot more often than I probably put two sets of tires on before, or at least before my roommates put any on their cars, you know? Uh, so there's certainly that. And my bike doesn't get very good gas mileage, um, which I remember calculating and being a little sad about, if I'm honest. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, I mean, I think, it, I think it, my bike's been pretty reliable. I, ha- I don't have huge complaints about my KTM, but was it as reliable as a Honda Civic? Probably not. I, I mean, I realistically, if we're being realistic, I, 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 the fuel pump, uh, went bunk. So I had to put a fuel pump in it. Um, and then I did a service and like a service at a shop. I don't know how much it would cost. Well, first of all, you don't have to service a Honda Civic. Do you, you have to put oil in it. Right. I mean, what (laughs) what do you have to do? Like my, my wife's car, you're, you're, I think, I don't think you're ever supposed to check the valves. It literally says like, don't do it. It that, that doesn't have, there's no, there's no spec there's no, it doesn't matter. You don't have to worry about it ever. Whereas at 10,000 miles, I spent $800 on, my KTM to have it serviced and have the, you know, have the, um, the, the fork oil changed and the, you know, like sort of a complete service. So that's significant. And I wasn't sad about it at the time, but certainly I was, I was eating costs that someone with insert econo box car here wouldn't have to worry about at all. Yeah. So I want to say too, cause I, I didn't do it as long as you did, but when I moved to LA, I spent the first two years in LA with only right. a motorcycle and 
you know, Zach, you hit on something that I want to just kind of bring this back around to is while we can, you know, advocate for people to change their own oil or, you know, uh, swap a chain and sprockets out, there are certain things where it is sometimes out of the purview of an individual to, to do themselves, especially if they're living in an apartment in the city. Um, right. And I remember there were, there were two occasions. One was the 12,000 mile service on my Triumph Bonneville was, you know, valve check. And at the time I was living in an apartment in Los Angeles. I just had to take it to a dealership. There was another time where I was riding down the 105 and a bucket fell off of a construction truck in front of me. I was able to swerve, but it hit my shift. Is lever that what happened it, to your face? Oh, sorry. Keep going. <laughs> <Whoops>. Um, <laughs> No, and it, it hit the shift lever and it cracked uh, the, the back seal of the case. And on both occasions, you know, on like a car where you can take it to like, there's probably, I don't know, 30 auto <laughs> mechanic shops within a five mile radius of where I live now. Um, and at the time, there were like two Triumph shops in Southern California, and right. it was a three to four week waiting list both times. So you had to like call, get an appointment, drop it off, have it serviced. Right. Um and, and the issue there is that if it is your only form of transportation, there is an opportunity cost of then you either have to rent a vehicle, you right. have to borrow a vehicle, you have to get rides places because there's right. not as many places to get it serviced. Absolutely. I think that's, I think that's a really good point. Um, well, if it's okay, uh, I'd like to just hit a couple other topics on this uh, maintenance. Um, you know, yeah, I wonder, yeah let's, keep diving in, let's keep diving into maintenance. So but I think that's what um, we're talking about. So yeah. Yes. So... Um, we we've talked about tires ad nauseum, I think. Um, I do want to touch on insurance, and I don't want this to turn into a thirty minute conversation. But uh, I don't know what your your research turned up. But basically, what I found was that average insurance rates for cars are a lot higher than I realized, um, and I think their average insurance rate for motorcycles are a lot higher than I realized. Um, and I don't I like I, I was basing, you know, mostly basically on what you, I, you're, you're telling us that you're very underinsured. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely. <laughs> Evidently. Um, uh, well, no, I mean, I, I looked at a spread of, of some costs that I that I saw. Um, and I guess I'm curious what you guys I don't know how comfortable you are telling the world how much you pay in insurance. But for me, I don't like my um, my my pickup truck and my motorcycle are both are both insured based on fairly low mileage because I don't use either of them very much. Um, but even still my, my old pickup truck costs more to insure than my old motorcycle does. Hmm. Um, it's pretty close, but it's, I guess it's comparable. Um, but, but yeah, like what, what, what are your, I guess, guest honors, Spencer, what's, what are your thoughts on insurance and what do you think about, what have you learned about insuring motorcycles and cars over the years? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think, Similar to you, I I have uh, a little bit of a tendency <laughs> for the uh, the budget minded vehicles, the the frugal vehicles, if you will. So uh -huh. I, I've never. I, it's rare that I've owned vehicles, uh, whether two wheeled or four wheeled, that are wildly expensive from an insurance perspective. Um, but every single time, my four wheeled vehicles have been more expensive than my two wheeled vehicles. That's been very consistent for me. And the research that I have seen. In general, and insurance is such a difficult yeah. thing to talk about. It's such it's a like, hornet's nest. What's your age and your gender, and what's your accident history, and, and where do you live? You're living in. And yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just there's a, a whole list of things that can affect how those numbers get calculated. But it does seem like, again, by and large, motorcycle insurance is less than car insurance. And you know, uh, caveat, caveat, caveat about how that could be different for you. But I, again, I think. On average, that is the case, and that's been, certainly been my experience. Wait, wait, well, you're you saying you think car insurance is cheaper or oh. is more expensive than motorcycle insurance? Oh yes, car insurance is more expensive than car. Like that's that is that was. Do you have full coverage on your motorcycles? All right, define full coverage. You know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, mother. <laughs> <laughs> The reason, so this is this has been my experience, and I did I did do uh, as we were talking about before some half-assed <laughs> internet research that suggests this is the 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 sort of general case nationwide, and that is because motorcycles are typically a little bit cheaper. They have fewer things that are likely to get damaged in an accident. You know, it's like you you whatever you damage a, a car sometimes, and they're like, oh, well, that body panel wraps all the way from the tailgate to the nose of the car, and then under the car, and then on top, and so we just actually need to buy you a new car. Um, so I think, I think in general, as from an insurance company's perspective, motorcycles are, are cheaper to insure just because they are not as expensive. And that goes back to the first question of yep. upfront costs. True. Yeah. I mean, so, if you have a, if you, if you have a motorcycle that costs $8,000 brand new, then an insurance company, even if they total it every time something happens to it, it's, 
it's like it's it's that that cost is that they can only really I mean they can do whatever they want I guess but realistically or theoretically they can only they can only ever need to spend that amount of money which is as Spencer said not all that much but it sounds like you've had a different perspective yes Virgin's winding up no I I just I had a completely different experience and I'm going to go back to you know when I was when I first bought my motorcycle I was living in rural Pennsylvania and the it was like twelve hundred dollars a year versus the 1987 Dodge Caravan that I was driving around, uh, which had barely any insurance on it. Was a much more affordable <laughs> vehicle to insure. Um, but when I moved to Southern California, the the cost of motorcycle insurance skyrocketed to like twenty two hundred dollars a year for full coverage. I had a lien on the bike. I had to have full coverage on it. And I remember okay. the time I had looked into getting a Sprint ST, which was a sport touring bike. Um, mm-hmm. from, from Triumph's lineup. And then the insurance was going to cost me $7,000 a year. Um, and at that point, what? I was like, well, yeah, for full, for full coverage insurance on the motorcycle. <laughs> and I, and I was 20, I was 23 years old. Um, I, you'd been in 15 accidents. I had never, I had never had, I had never had a claimed accident, uh, for in, in, in the five years previous to that. Um, but I like I was, you said claimed there. <laughs> I never had a claimed accident. Yeah. Well, you, if, you, if you can fix it, if you can like use some duct tape and put it back together, <laughs> you just don't tell the insurance company. No, but that's that's interesting. And I have yeah. a quick question: Is our this is I'm going to sound like a real babe in the woods here, but um, are, is insurance more expensive when you finance something? Well, if, if you, you have finance, it, you have something? to have full coverage on it. So there's a minimum yeah. amount of insurance you have to take if you're financing a vehicle. I don't I'm guessing feel like my I insurance do. is that bad. I don't. Maybe I. Maybe. maybe yeah. I feel like I probably bad. don't <laughs> have the same level of insurance you did on your Bonnie on my <clears throat> Zuma 125. <laughs> well, that's. So. <laughs> I, but I think that's the other thing of this too is like what bike, how much is it worth, and what's your age bracket? Where are you right. living in? Because right. again, the other aspect of this is motorcycles are seen as more dangerous, and therefore they're oftentimes going to have higher insurance costs than than cars are. One interesting tidbit that I read about that that. that sort of lends itself to being good for motorcycles is that typically when motorcycles are in accidents, they cause less damage to other things than cars do. So yeah. that is that is one small factor that I think can lower the cost. But that is, <laughs> your, your numbers are, are shocking there. I, I was not expecting, I didn't know yeah, that you could pay that much in motorcycle insurance. And again, I'm sure How much was that changed. sprint? How much was that Sprint ST that you were going to buy? Like twelve grand? I could have bought grand? two of them. No, the Sprint yeah. ST was like seventy nine hundred dollars, and it was and like, it was going to be seven grand. The the quote insurance. that I got from Progressive at the time, Goodness and again gracious. this was twenty uh, fifteen fifteen years ago. Um, the, wow. the quote that I got from Progressive was almost as much as buying a second motorcycle, and that was why I didn't yeah. buy the bike. I was like, I could just buy a second one, <laughs> stick it in a storage <laughs> facility somewhere, and when I wreck the first one, I'll just have a spare. <laughs> right, um, I'll build my own insurance policy. So um, yeah, in my in yeah. my experience, I've found that, and maybe it's the cars that I'm driving too. Maybe this speaks more to the vehicles that I'm driving. Um, but <laughs> typically, I have found that the motorcycle has been slightly more expensive to insure okay. Uh, okay. than my cars have been. Well, I think that's I think that's fair, and I think we can. I think if you guys are okay with it, we'll leave the insurance discussion there because it is it is a pretty big ball of wax, um, uh, and we've 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 been. Um, um, vulnerable with our <laughs> open and honest with our own insurance experiences. Um, and your, your, uh, your results may vary. Obviously, you know, I, I know that there are lots of caveats as, as we've said about that kind of thing. One thing I wanted to talk about is parking in tolls, which mm. I know is a big thing. It, it depends, right? Some, t- some people might go over across, you know, they might go over three bridges and have to park in a parking garage for their commute. And other people might be like, I don't pay for parking no matter where I go. So this doesn't matter to me. Um, but I would say, uh, well, uh, guest honors yet again, Spencer. What what do you um, what what are your what, what are your feelings here on like cars yeah. versus motorcycles, uh, parking and tolls? Sure, sure, yeah. Guest guest honors really uh, paying dividends today. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in in general, I think uh, another sort of agreed upon thing is that motorcycle parking is easier and more affordable, and that depends where you are and what you're doing and so on and so forth. I will say that if motorcycle parking or tolls for that matter, is ever not cheaper, it certainly should be. Because when no, in, the, in the few occasions where I've had to pay for parking and it's the same price as a car or like you, whatever, you get into a park or something and they're like, oh yeah, yeah. Like this little parking area. I'm like, it's, I'm half of a car at least, or at most. I mean, and I mean, the toll road thing drives me bonkers uh, that it's yeah. $4 for a car and it's $4 for a bike. And I'm like, I, you could send 
a thousand motorcycles across this bridge and it's you're not going to have to maintain it because they only weigh 400 pounds and I'm paying the same as this douche brick in his Escalade. <laughs> I don't want to go too far off topic here, but the other piece of this that drives me insane that's kind of slated in with this is like getting into like a national park. Yeah. And you're like, oh, wait, the motorcycle with one person on it is the same cost yes. as the, the the Voyager van with seven oh, people oh. stuck in it. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. Those, those national parks are always out to get you. I'm telling yeah, you. Exactly. They're, they're <laughs> anti-motorcycles. Boo. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, I like I, I think in general, my experience has been positive uh, yes. that motorcycles are cheaper. And I think the best example of this, and this is, I almost hesitate to to share this on such a, a massive platform as high side, low side. Spencer's um, parking hack. Here we go. Well, this is you. You taught me this lesson. I oh, think no, I Zach. know where you're if, going with this, and I'm crossing <laughs> my fingers that this is where you're going with it. So go ahead. If you live in uh, Los Angeles and you are flying out of LAX, motorcycle parking is free, and you can park directly next to your terminal. I just did this last week and mm -hmm. it is it just like every time I do it I feel like I am yeah. doing something illegal or cheating. But right. instead like, there are like there's signs everywhere that say please park. You can park here for like twenty days, no charge. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's that like, was it's that like was what I was some sort say. of celebrity. Yeah. yeah. No it's when amazing. I was living when I was living in California it was the easiest thing to do when you're when I was flying home for the holidays or to visit family like you could just yeah, pack a great. duffel bag, strap it to the back of your bike, ride right up to where your terminal was, park. And because of lane filtering, you didn't have, like, if there was a huge backed up line, you yeah, could kind of cut to the front of the line and make agreed. your flight no matter when. So, yeah, it was agreed, great. Agreed, agreed. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's there there are certainly advantages, and there there are certainly times, I guess, worst case scenario, in my experience with a motorcycle, you're not going to completely get shafted with parking or with tolls. You're just... It, there's going to be some amount of injustice potentially because you're going to pay the yeah. same as a car, but you're not going to pay more. It's not going to exactly. be worse. Yeah, yeah you, you'll never pay more, but you might pay less, which is, okay. you know, it's, it's a net positive. So, so uh, just to just to try to try to cap this off because this has been a long section of the conversation. Would 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 we say that motorcycles are cheaper to maintain? Tires, insurance, parking, tolls. All this stuff. Are motorcycles would, cheaper would, over the long run, do you guys think? I would say there are some tips that we could impart on people to help <laughs> cut down on those costs. And I think Well, we don't have too much airtime spurge, so keep it I tight. understand. But but one is <laughs> is like watching Ari Henning's shop manual and ah, looking nice plug. at like Good plug. changing changing <laughs> your own oil, changing your own chain and sprockets. There are some basic maintenance costs that do get expensive if you go to a shop and pay $400 to have a chain and sprockets done versus you can do it yourself in a parking lot for, you know, a hundred bucks. So I think there's, there are some things about maintaining your own vehicles, about yes. tire selection. The other big one here, we talked a lot about tires, but oftentimes if you're willing to take the wheels off yourself, you know, get a stand and, and jack your motorcycle up, take the wheels off. You can take the wheels in to get your tires swapped, and that's going to save you money uh, compared to if you took them the whole motorcycle True. and they had to do that work. So I think things like that. But then like you got to buy the stands. You can go to Harbor Freight and get a motorcycle jack for under a hundred dollars, and that will pay for itself within <laughs> the first time you use it to change your your motorcycle. All right. Yeah, good, 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 good counterpoint. You 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 heard it here first. Yeah, th this is all this is all. Good, good stuff to point out, and it, I guess it, the same as changing your own oil in your in your car too, for that matter. Yeah, I, it seems it seems to me that uh, you know motorcycles are probably more expensive to maintain in the long term, not necessarily by a so. huge amount. I don't yeah, think it's right. going to be like if if the motorcycle and the car are of commensurate japanese -ness, say um <laughs> then uh then they're they're probably not that far off because i don't right. think anyone is like oh my cbr 300 is just killing me on maintenance but <laughs> i i do think in the long run because of consumable parts and whatnot motorcycles are probably gonna gonna hit your wallet a little bit harder i think i think that that's fair and like you said certainly there are specific motorcycles and specific cars that would have a the opposite you know whether it's insurance or whatever but but yeah, I think I feel comfortable with that. Spurs, you feel comfortable capping that section with with that uh, that bombshell? I, yeah, I think I don't. I, I'm going to lean a little bit heavier than 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 Spencer, and just the fact that like I do think motorcycles are more expensive to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Pretty, especially when you get into like valve checks and services and all that stuff. Uh, I you know I think that it's going to be a more expensive uh, maintenance endeavor for a lot of people. Um, well, speaking of maintenance, this is probably a great time. To get a quick ad from our sponsor, Motul. Is all yeah, about if you want to save money on maintaining your motorcycle, start a podcast, get a sponsorship from Motul. They send you <laughs> free oil and you don't have to pay for it anymore. It's fantastic. <laughs>
All righty, team. Spurgeon's looking at his phone. Whenever he's ready to share his time with the class, we'll, okay, we can move on now. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunbar. The next topic is going to be a fun one. You guys ready for this? Spencer, are you ready? It's going to be oh, guest uh, honors. Yeah, take a sip of water. Do ready. it. Mm. Yeah, okay. The next uh, topic I'm, is do <laughs> motorcycles get better gas mileage? I was waiting for you to do the whole thing where you take a sip of water, Zach says it, and then you just spit the water everywhere. You're like, yes, <laughs> spit, so, so yeah. excited. A spit take. Nice. We should, yeah. we should work that into the next question. I'll keep that in mind. Spencer, Robert, what do you think? Do motorcycles get better gas mileage than cars? Everybody's favorite answer in this episode, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> uh, and it does, right? Like it, it, I, keep, I keep going back to this thing of trying to give the most defensible answer possible, which is like if you had to average everything out, I think on average, motorcycles are going to be more fuel efficient than cars. Yes. Now, are there cars that get better fuel economy than motorcycles? Absolutely, that can happen. And I think especially with electric vehicles, that conversation is getting more and more interesting. Um, but if, 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 I, if someone was just like, find a fuel efficient vehicle as quickly as you can, and I had to throw a, you know, a, a dart at a board of cars or motorcycles, I would feel more comfortable throwing a, a dart at a board of motorcycles. I like that. That's a, that's a great way to put it. I think, that's, I think that's smart. Spurge, thoughts? I No, I agree. I think like, I, and I was trying to go through the the comparisons, right? Like my dad drives a Honda Civic Hybrid and I drive a Toyota Tacoma. And I think yep. that's a good range of like, I get 16 miles to the gallon and cry and he's, you know, puttering along at an average of like 45 miles to the gallon. Um, you know, so I think that when you're thinking about cars, you have a, a that that's kind of a good range. But with motorcycles, like it's really not hard to find a slew of solid motorcycles that average in the 40s, you know, as long as you're not riding an MT-10, uh, you know, I think you're, you're usually, you know, in, in good company, like, uh, and, and we can kind of get into this in a minute here, but like my, the 890 that I just got averages in the mid forties. Um, yeah. and that's some of the comparison I was doing against, do I, do I take the, the 890 to work or do I take the Tacoma to work? So, yeah, I mean, even a 1290, I, I had a 1290 Super Duke for a year, a year long loan. I put like 10,000 miles on it and I got 40 basically. Yeah. With, and that bike's uh, it's like a pretty high performance bike, Spencer. So, I, well, what I was going to say that obviously this is not fuel efficiency, but we are we're, we're talking about fuel efficiency from the perspective of cost. I think. Do most do you think more motorcycles require or ask that you fill up with premium than cars, though? Because that is that can yeah, nice. that can come back and sting you a little bit. True, because because as an example, we talked about fuel prices a little bit earlier, but right now I think. It's almost six bucks a gallon for for regular where we are, uh, Spencer. It's maybe five ninety or five ninety five at most places right now. Yeah. Um, but for premium, it's six fifty, right? That's six forty, six fifty, something like that, mm -hmm. which is not nothing. So, yeah, that's a good question. But you also, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I'm you, not have sure to, how to you have to cover that. a lot of miles for it to start to have an impact. Exactly. But, exactly, but like yeah. this, you know, this goes back to the first question of like, you know, where are you riding? How often are, are you riding? What sort of mileage do you cover in a year right. riding or driving? Because and so I started doing some of this comparison with the article that I was putting together around this. And it, it ties back into tires a little bit, but focusing just on the gas mileage for a second, <laughs> I do put premium gas in the 890. I put 87 bare bones octane in Tacoma. Um, E, like not talking about how much it costs per gallon, I can I can get almost 200 miles on a tank with the 890. I can get maybe 300 miles out of a tank with the Tacoma, and I would have to I would be able to fill up. I think I pay 20 roughly 20 dollars for a fill up for the 890 and about $90 to fill up the Tacoma. So I would be able to fill up the 890 four and a half times with premium um, and get almost a thousand miles out of it to equal one tank out of the Tacoma. And again, again, I'm using yeah, yeah. the extreme of like a low mileage pickup truck. Whereas like no. if I was riding my dad's Honda Civic, it would be a different story. Yeah, but I can, yeah, yeah. I can, I can roughly get, uh, it would cost me, if I spent a hundred dollars in the 890 and $100 in the Tacoma, I could get roughly a thousand miles in the 890 for about 300 miles in the Tacoma. Right. 
Yeah, that's interesting. That's a that's kind of an interesting comparison. And I don't think that, you know, yeah, 16 miles to the gallon in your Tacoma is not great, but there are a lot of Tacomas on the road, first of all, and there are a lot of cars that get approximately that mileage, right? Would you guys agree? I mean, there there yeah. are an unfortunate number of cars on the road that get sub let's say sub 20, 20, let's say sub 20 yeah. miles to the gallon. Cuz even if yeah, even if sure. I was like, you know, babying the Tacoma and, you know, keeping the revs down and was eking out like 19 miles per gallon, which I've which I've done already on like cross country trips where I hop on the highway mm -hmm hit cruise control, it's still the the, the eight ninety yeah. still wins. And that's with yeah. high yeah. octane yeah. gas, you know, versus the eighty seven octane. I yep. go ahead, Spencer. Well, I was I am curious because I heard you talking about this to someone else, Zach, but I didn't actually get a chance to talk to you about it. I rode a live wire into work today. You were yeah. recently riding that zero FXE. Uh -huh. Didn't you run some calculations on how much it costs to fill up the FXE? I did. I did. And I got, I got my eyes went a little crossed because I'm not very good at math, as I mentioned once before in this podcast, but, uh, it gets, it gets really hard because all the variables are so, are so different. So you have to sort of like pick a bike that you're, that you're, I don't know, you have to pick a bike that you're comparing an electric bike to. It's easier to just pick a specific model because if you say like, oh, well, like any motorcycle that one to get 75 miles to gallon or 50 miles to gallon, it gets really kind of blurry and hard to calculate. But yeah, basically, um, Again, fuel, you know, I'm, I was putting gas in a bike here in Southern California at $6 a gallon. Um, and, you know, so if you put two gallons of gas in a motorcycle and you, you'll you spend 12 bucks, uh, the amount that it cost me to fill up uh, based on my electric rates, as far as I could tell, was about $1.15 to fill up the Zero FXE. And I could go 45 miles-ish. So let's call it 50 miles. Um so if you have a bike that you could get 50 miles to the gallon, then you would be paying about a dollar for to fill up the electric bike and about six dollars. So you're it's a sixth the cost. And Andy figured it out in today. So if you look at the article on Common Tread yep. that is titled uh, uh, "Best Fuel Efficient Motorcycles in Every Category," Andy did the math and he said it's it's somewhere around uh, 215 miles per gallon equivalent. Yeah, so that's uh, notable, I think. And I will say, you know, the FXE that I was riding around has a seven point had a seven point two kilowatt hour battery, which is pretty small. The live wire that you mentioned, Spencer, it, I don't remember how big the battery is, but I want to say it's eighteen or twenty. It's pretty big. It's a it's yeah. a big battery, and uh, and it has a fast charger. And Jen Jen did a two hundred and sixty mile day, maybe or something, two hundred and fifty mile day. Uh, on the live wire, that sounds um, like a lot. I'd be I'd be really impressed if that. No, was... No, no, she she like micro charged, so she would ride oh, to okay. a, ride, a charging station, then she would charge for fifteen minutes, and then ride some more, and then charge. So she did this sort of like micro dosing of electricity, <laughs> as as she called it. Um, so it wasn't not that wasn't on one charge, but just to be clear, that's a pretty good day of riding. You know, she she I don't even think she left particularly early or got home particularly late. You know, like that was just a thing that she did, and 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 she was able to get, you know, more than two hundred miles. Out of, out of a day of riding with an electric motorcycle, so that's, that's a, not that's like a, FXE. I would say that's which, especially good if you're if you're microdosing. So like if you're in like Baker, California, where the giant thermometer is, the uh -huh. electric Tesla charging station is right next to a Dairy Queen. So if you could figure that out, <laughs> where like you get ice cream every stop, every time mm. every time you stop and charge for 15 minutes, right. like that's the right. kind of motorcycle day then, I want to be part of. Right, and you're, microdosing you're riding, of it. Good. I was gonna say your riding buddies will be like. An ice cream again, and you're like, look, it's this electric bike. It's not my fault. Yeah, I don't know. I can't help it. Yeah, and microdosing micro with Dairy Queen is, is really, I think, the life we all want to be living. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So so there are there are big caveats here, and I guess, I don't know. I think I think saying, you know, I like what you said, Spencer, about like if I was going to throw a dart at a board full of motorcycles and a dart at a board full of car models, and it was like low gas or good gas mileage was the was the goal, you'd, you'd choose the motorcycle board. But I just feel like if you were arranging your life around fuel mileage in any sense, you know, if you have a, if you have a, a long, a long commute, I just feel like it's pretty hard to argue with cars. I, I feel like it's hard to argue with like the, the advancements that have been made, whether it's an electric car or a hybrid car that just get such good mileage and realistically from a comfort standpoint are pretty good. You know, like this is not taking into account traffic or anything like oh, that. Oh, we're but, not talking but, about comfort, man. Now you're throwing it into a completely different category. <laughs> no, no, no. You're, you're right. You're right. Fair enough. And I mean, I, I don't want to get into like the, what's more fun. I don't, I don't want to talk about that yet, but, but it's, 
I don't know. It just, it's like, it's hard to argue with, like when you think about how many just regular Toyota Priuses there are on the road that people are just driving around and just using as, as an appliance as they are, <laughs> you know, they, they get better mileage than a lot of motorcycles. You know, they get as, I disagree as, with as, you, man. Like, I think like it depends on what you're looking at, but like you could go out and buy a Honda NC 750X with a frunk, yeah. and you talk about comfort and convenience, yeah. and you're gonna <laughs> get you're gonna get 70 one, miles to the gallon. That's one motorcycle that's designed to get good gas but mileage. You could, I'm I mean, you could also any, if you you're could, just buying a motorcycle to own a motorcycle, just just to have it. You're not like I'm I'm getting a a bike to be fuel efficient. If you're just like I'm getting a bike because I want to get a bike, I'm getting an MT09, whatever. Like, what about like an MT-07 or uh, um, like a Honda Grom? Like there's there's a, there's a ton of bikes out there that are that are relatively fuel efficient. Plenty. I mean, but if you, I'm talking about purchasing a motorcycle without fuel efficiency in mind. You're just getting the one that you want. Okay. So the purchase one that... a car without fuel efficiency in mind. Take the take the Prius off the off the the the, 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 the map here. And look at that, all the no, crossovers no. that are popular and SUVs that are popular. And I mean, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. I just think that plenty of people buy cars that are accidentally very fuel efficient because all they they, they just want to get somewhere. And if you just accidentally buy a fuel because- efficient, I don't think they're going to be accidentally more than thirty or thirty five miles per gallon. And I think that if you look at the average motorcycle, the average motorcycle is probably around high thirties or low forties if you take all of them and scope them together. Yeah, yeah. I, I think. Not- I mean, Zach, I, I feel like what what you're saying is, well. I still think it is more likely that you have a motorcycle that is accidentally fuel efficient than it is a car that's accidentally fuel efficient. I think it's more likely that if you if you have a car that's very fuel efficient, that's kind of why you bought that car, as opposed to a motorcycle that is like, oh yeah, I wanted this MT-07 and it just happens to get 45 miles per gallon or something right. like that. But you absolutely, I mean, going back to the, the used car thing, you can buy a you know, 2007 to 2009 Prius for so cheap. Maybe it'll have 200,000 miles, but it'll have AC. It'll be comfortable. It'll be quiet. You'll get 50 miles per gallon or something you close can put to three it. Three so, friends in it. Yeah. yeah. So, like, if if you if that is your single-minded pursuit, is I just want good fuel economy, and you're also trying to maintain you know some level of of comfort in in your life, uh, other than the comfort of a healthy bank account, um, <laughs> then uh, then yeah, I think it is possible to achieve similar results with a car. I just don't think it's as easy. But what's more comfortable than having a passenger in the back wrapped around you? I mean, it just that's that's the comfort I'm looking for. Well, I yeah. mean, I will say in in defense of motorcycles, Spurgeon, you bought the bike. You didn't buy a bike with fuel efficiency in mind. You just bought a motor, you bought the motorcycle that you wanted. You bought a, a KTM. 890 it was adventure. a happy accident that i was getting 40 miles i didn't even i didn't even yeah. look like so, like people are like how like i didn't even look to see what yeah. the mpgs were and, you were disappointed like, you were like this should be 25 i'm having yeah, too much exactly. yeah. i need to be burning more fuel god yeah. darn it <laughs> so um yeah i think i think that that's uh you can certainly get cars that have better fuel mileage than that but that's pretty good like in the world of cars that's decent fuel mileage I, wa- I will say that I was surprised that it's it wasn't alarmingly better than the 1090 was, you know, because I, I had the 1090 <laughs> beforehand and I remember going to the 890 yeah. thinking like, oh, this, you know, this will be a fit more efficient. But it was a, it was about <laughs> the same. And I think that speaks volumes to a lot of these bikes, you know, when you get up into some of the, um, you know, the, the higher end models, you know, that are fuel injected, that are really you know, designed to, to be efficient in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I feel like that's where motorcycles do have kind of a baseline of around, you know, high thirties, low forties. And that's kind of like the average for motorcycles. Yeah. And it's, and it, if you did, if you really were, you know, if you have a commute that's 50 miles each way and it's mostly freeway and you just want a bike to get good gas mileage, it's like that. It's not like you have to get an NC 750. You can get a Honda NC 700 or NC 750, which only revs to 6,000 RPM or whatever, or the old one did, and and is designed to be very efficient. And uh, you can get it with an automatic transmission, all that jazz. Sure, you can do that. But even if you just get a an MT 07 or a Versus 650, gets 55 pretty easily, right? And, and unless you're Ari Henning going up to Laguna at <laughs> wide open, like he, 37 or something. He, like yeah, he, he got he got a fuel figure that I didn't know was possible on a, on a versus <laughs> 650. He did also have it loaded down with camping gear and like it was heavy and he was flogging yeah. it, right? And, but and I, think, I think he, go ahead. No, I was just to say, I, I just think the important note to make here, and like it goes back to, you know, I've mentioned like the Honda Superhawk before in the program, but like that's a bike <laughs> that was notoriously bad on gas. I remember filling that up and I was getting about 32 miles of the gallon um, on on that particular motorcycle, and that's an older bike. But like, even even by today's car standards, if you had a brand new car that was getting 32 miles to the gallon, 
that would be a pretty fuel efficient car. Um, so yeah. for like one of the least fuel efficient motorcycles that I've ever ridden <laughs> is still more fuel efficient than the average car today. I think that's that's kind of an yeah. indicator of like motorcycles are more fuel efficient than than cars are. You, you still have to ride my KTM, Spurge. Yeah. What, so what do you, you what can. do you get on your KTM? What's your average? Let's, no, what, I, what do you? I, it's been so long since I've do it. it. Take us again. What I remember thirty when I rode around San Francisco. I remember calculating more than one. I mean, ver- a variety of fuel figures that were in the twenties. Really? <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Um, but yeah, you, you have it, you have like it jetted gas, out, man. and you have that in race mode. You know, all the time. <laughs> That's right. My right wrist knows only one mode. Rev so, line. um, I think. I think we have all, you know, I've defended cars as best I could, really. Um, but I think that it's, f- I think we've, we've come to an agreement, and people might disagree. Sound off in the comments if you, if you like, that motorcycles get better gas mileage, sort of on average, than cars do. So, I yeah, feel like we're comfortable uh, yeah, what I will say is that when I did the nope, math on nope. this... Uh, <laughs> Just I'll, I'll, no, I'll save it. I'll save it for. I'll save it for the conclusion, actually. Yeah, because it ties it all together. This gonna is going to be a big topic here, because we're circling back to the original question: Are motorcycles the cheapest way to get around? That was the question that we that we were sort of trying to answer here. And and I think uh, keeping in mind, right, that this is all based on this sort of like spiking fuel costs and sort of like wh- how much does it cost to to own and use and have a motorcycle around? And we agreed that motorcycles are cheaper up front. We agreed that it might be more expensive to maintain. We agreed that they do get, get better gas mileage. So now we're coming back to this, what's your recommendation? Someone comes to you and says, oh, I, you know, I don't know, I've been thinking about getting a motorcycle, you know, to save money. What do you say, uh, uh, guest honor, Spencer Robert? Ah, this, this is so difficult to, to answer because it really depends on... Well, that's why on... we had you on as a guest because... We well, really yeah, I mean, difficult questions. for you guys to answer. It'll be easy for me. Um, <laughs> No, it, it really does come down to, uh, you know, where do you live and what does your, like, what are your riding habits? What are, what are your mileage requirements and sort of transportation requirements? Those are the biggest right. things because it's very easy for uh, any of us that have lived on the West Coast to be like, yeah, sure, just get a motorcycle, save money. But right. that doesn't obviously take into account uh, the cost, which is like the cost of riding a motorcycle in winter is maybe not financial, but maybe physical and mental and emotional and all of these things. <laughs> I think the you word know, you're like, looking for is brutal. Brutal. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think if you live in an environment where you can ride a motorcycle year round and if you are looking to cover distances that are, you know, just say less than... 30 or 50 miles a day, something like that, like, like a relatively short distance, I think a motorcycle can still be cheaper total. Like, uh, let me go back to my alien metaphor. Like if I, if I was an alien dropped on earth and, and my overlords gave me $10,000 and I was in California or Arizona and they said, all right, this is the only money you have for transportation for the year and whatever's left over you can spend on Dairy Queen. Um, (laughs) I, I feel confident I would have more money left over for Dairy Queen if I, bought a motorcycle than if I bought a car. Right. Um, and that has okay. to do with the upfront costs, the, the, the fuel economy, but also has to do with the way I ride, the maintenance that I'm comfortable doing on a motorcycle. There are right. a lot of factors, where sure, I sure. live, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I'm, I, very, I, I'm very curious to hear what you guys think. Yeah, I, I like, for, I like, I like the way they you work Dairy Queen into this again. And now that I know, now that I know <laughs> what I'm really working towards, this gives me some yeah. real motivation to think about exactly. the answer. Right. Zach, what do you got? How many blizzards can I buy? Zach, how many uh, blizzards can you buy if you buy a motorcycle versus a car? Well, I don't think anyone's going to like my answer, but what it comes down to for me, and we, you know, we talked about doing some sort of like um, having fun with personas here. For those of you that listened to the high side, low side, where we did the motorcycle dating game, we did, you know, this is Jesse, 23 years old. This is the financial situation. This is the, you know, um, so you could do that with this too, right? You could say, this is someone's, someone's age, demographic, location, commute, socioeconomic status does it make sense for them to get a bike this is someone else's blah 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 does it make sense for them to get a bike for me what it comes down to is is a desire is desire is do you know do you want to do it because i every time i think about this question and whether it's specific like i had a friend um uh, my wife's good friend her father um you know fella in his mid 50s or maybe 60 and he said oh my office is moving from a few miles from my house to like across town 
and I was thinking about getting a getting a scooter, you know, like a like a big scooter that can go on the highway and you know, like in transit, I'd get much better gas mileage, it might be kind of fun. What do you think? And I, you know, what I told him is the same thing that I would say in almost any situation, which is that, you know, do you want to do it? Do is, is it something that you want to focus on? Because I think that is what it takes. You have to be ready to be uncomfortable when it's hot and ready to be uncomfortable when it rains and and ready for for the inherent risk that comes along with riding a vehicle that can tip over when it stops or is not as safe in in a in a two vehicle accident. So those are things that you need to reconcile before you can really go down this path and I think that outweighs this financial thing and that's what I always come back to which I realize isn't a very satisfying answer but I, I agree with Spencer's characterization but it it all falls back to sort of how how much how much how much do you want it you know like yeah you can save money if you if you if you get a scooter and you you know commute across town on that but is that what you want like you're going to be happier because that's kind of at the end why we do this right well i think that's the big point and i'm glad that you hit on that because if you buy a motorcycle and it just sits in the garage you're never going to save money on it you're not going to get <laughs> better gas mileage than taking the car into work every day because you're not actually riding it. And I think that's the biggest misconception for a lot of people is they see motorcycles as this idyllic uh, form of transportation. And then the reality sits in. They're like, you know what? I'm more of an air conditioning in the summer and a heater in the winter kind of individual. Right. And right, they don't right. they yep. don't realize what that what that means for them. Yeah. Yeah. I. I often think of the, the there's an interaction in uh, the the 2006 uh, magician film The Prestige, um, where this this character <laughs> save trying it to convince... for the next movie episode, <laughs> man. <laughs> Who stars in that? That's uh, Hugh Jackman. Hugh, uh... Hugh Jackman. So this is a conversation between Hugh Jackman and David Bowie. David Bowie's playing Nikola Tesla, and Hugh Jackman wants him to build this machine, and uh, Nikola Tesla is kind of pushing back on it. And Hugh Jackman says, uh, "Money is no object." And Nikola Tesla says, "But have you considered the cost?" And I feel like that's what it, what it comes down to is like right. it, it might be financially cheaper to ride a motorcycle for a year than, say, a car. But the cost in many other ways has certainly the potential of being quite a bit higher, whether that's your your health or your comfort or your you know social circle, because you are like, you know, you can't road trip with people, whatever it might be. There yep. is certainly the potential of a high cost. Yeah. Well, so that's the flip side of that <laughs> is. If you're a motorcycle fan, like if you actually enjoy riding motorcycles, this is something that's fun for you. And a few minutes ago, you know, you had asked me about the, the, the 1090 or the 890 and said, well, that's not why you bought it, right? You didn't buy it to save money on gas. So my conclusion was, you know, and this goes into some of the personal math that I was doing. I was comparing my Toyota Tacoma with my 890. And I figured out that if I was to map out 100 mi- or 100,000 miles with both vehicles, um, how much it would cost me. And Whoa. basically, I go, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I did it to 90,000 miles because I'm averaging 90,000 miles on the tires that I have on the Tacoma right now. I get about 90,000 miles out of the tires. And wow. they cost me about $1,000 for the set of tires. Um, BF Goodrich, they're amazing tires. I'll throw that out. <laughs> we'll, we'll put a link in <laughs> This there. portion of the podcast brought um, to you by BF Goodrich. But I also, because my 890 is, is I use it purposefully, um, you know, I have TKC80s on there, and I'm averaging about 3,500 miles on the TKC80s. So the roughly $9,000 I would have spent in gas savings over that 90,000 miles, I had to factor back into the 22 sets of TKC80s that I was going to have to purchase and put onto the motorcycle. Um, Which now, 22 sets of TKC80s is no joke, right? You, I assume you did the math on that. If not, did, I'm going to do it right now. No, I did the math on it. It's no joke, and it, it ate up the fuel savings. Yeah, like that. So almost nine grand. Wow. It, which is about I would I would have saved about nine grand in in fuel. So it literally came wow. to an even head, right? But what that's not that's it, that's only factoring in fuel costs. That's not factoring in the fact that I've gone ninety thousand miles in the Tacoma, and aside from oil changes every six thousand miles and one U joint, the Tacoma <laughs> hasn't cost me anything. And right. with the with the eight ninety. It, there's going to be service there. There's going to be service in oil changes and chain and sprockets and getting the valves yeah. checked. So yeah. uh, the motorcycle is is more expensive. And now, there are things that I could do to offset those costs. If I wasn't riding the bike off-road and I was using you know, s- right. uh, sport touring tires, that would immensely cut down on the cost there. So there are ways that you can make it more affordable. But for right. the enthusiasts among us, it really comes down to how you're using the bike too. Like, are you so, really going to be timid on the throttle? 
are you gonna are you gonna airy henning it like when you're <laughs> on your versus six fifty? So if you were if you were Spurgeon Dunbar, polite man about town, that would be fine. But that's but not who I is, am. Who am I? You Zach? are. Come on, Spurgeon Dunbar, purposeful rider. Yes, Pine Barren Scourge. You got it. <laughs> that's yeah. I I think that's a um, I think that's a you never thing. cease to amaze me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an important thing uh, to remember, and I think that all this comes comes around to 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 the person wanting it right and i think that's i th- i think actually remember i said i wanted to bring something up at the end yeah i, I have it, i have i wrote a note here to remind you <laughs> to bring it up do at you, the end do you remember what i was talking about was i talking about my ktm you're I talking think? about your, yeah, KTM. I think your ktm right yep so so well i'm so glad you asked so i the, what i was going to say is basically this is the 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 joy that i received from i spent i think i spent eight thousand dollars on that bike in 2009 um, and that was a splurge for me in, in those days, uh, back before I was a very wealthy and successful podcaster. So, um, I, uh, but working, you know, out, it, working it, out of your closet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, anyway, the point is the, 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 could I have saved money if I took the bus every day to work? Undoubtedly. <laughs> uh, I think I, I, you know, like the, the, the cost was, was, I think $75 a month at that time to um, something like that for the, for the, for the pass. The, the point is I could, I would have taken public transit for decades, I think before I really, you know, uh, bumped up against the cost there. But the, but the, the, the joy of riding my bike to work, the joy of leaving work every day and looking at the clock and thinking, I get to ride that bike home. And when I do, I'm riding across this new city and I can go, whatever way I want. I can go past the beach if I want to. I can go across Golden Gate Bridge if I want to. I can ride twisty roads for an hour at the end of the day if I want to. I can go straight home if I want to. That that freedom and that feeling that I got, I, w- I wouldn't, I don't know if I could put a price on it, but it was obviously more than $8,000. <laughs> but, but I think the other aspect of that is, is the cost savings of how you're planning on spending your recreational time. Because when I was only riding True. the Bonneville, and I spent a little bit less for the Bonneville than you spent for your KTM, but I right, I was I, a, I was a public high school teacher, so I didn't have the money to spend, um, you know, on, on vacations and things like that at the time. But I did have twelve dollars to fill up the tank on the Bonneville and go up Angeles Crest Mountain and and have yep. a fun weekend and eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you know <laughs> on a picnic bench and like, so uh, there were there were recreational wins that I think can be associated yeah. with that as well true which you're I mean, not going to get with a prius right probably yeah well i mean the, i will say uh, i don't want to i don't want to knock the thrill and joy that comes with uh saving a few pennies because that can be <laughs> that can be quite the experience itself so whether you're in a fuel efficient car or a fuel efficient <laughs> uh motorcycle you know get, give it a, give it a try the you know frugality has it's got its own kicks and i do recommend it what I Spencer say, does, so just so you guys know, is he'll he'll find a vehicle that he wants to buy, like you know, on OfferUp or Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, or whatever, and then he'll not buy it, and then he'll be like, "Oh, that's six thousand dollars that I still have." Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Agreed? Yeah. yeah, I mean, basically, yeah. <laughs> that's what who, you have to do. You got to learn to love the right thing. Exactly. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's certainly cheaper than the alternative. Let me ask. <laughs> let me ask you this. So if we can kind of we can kind of close things out. If mm-hmm. you were purposefully going after a vehicle to get around on the cheap and you were going to find yourself uh, a, a cheap vehicle do you think you could find one that would be more advantageous to go in motorcycle or to go for a car us personally not not like no like we've talked a lot about like in this particular episode we've talked about a lot, a lot about like oh well that's not the reason that we do this or that's not the reason that you bought this motorcycle that's not the reason that you you went out and got this car if you were if you if i said to you you have to go out and you have to find a fuel efficient vehicle that you are going to maintain yourself or that you are not going to maintain yourself <laughs> or however however you want to figure it out like do you think that you would be able to purposefully buy a motorcycle or a car for you, for you and yourself and your riding style, which would it be car or motorcycle for the cheapest? Uh, guest honors. Oh, guest honors. I was waiting. <laughs> um, 
if be, because I am uh, competitive, and if I, in my mind this is now a competition <laughs> of how much money can you save, I would get a motorcycle. I would Spencer find a motorcycle. Would kill someone for a motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs> it's I would free. Find, <laughs> I would find a motorcycle like this Battle Toad that we bought for eight hundred dollars. I know that people like don't believe that we bought it for that, but whatever. In any case, it, 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 I would find a motorcycle for between one and two thousand dollars that got. 40 to 60 miles per gallon and i think you would be very hard pressed to find a car that could match that plus i love riding motorcycles and i live in a place where it rains pretty infrequently <laughs> and where the temperatures are too infrequently um and and the temperatures are very uh temperate throughout the entire year so like i don't mind riding when it rains because it rains six times a year and i don't mind riding when it gets cold because it's like 50 degrees. Um, so I personally, if the goal was to save money, I would get a motorcycle. Zach? I agree. Spurgeon? I, I think my situation would be a little bit more difficult just because of where I live compared to where yeah. the two of you live. True. Um, you know, and you I, there's, definitely, there's definitely Prius some times great. where there's freezing Can rain or there's Prius? snow or, or any of that stuff. And you just, it's, and I've, and I've ridden in the snow um, and, and the freezing rain and it's not fun and it's a little bit more dangerous than if you're in a car. Um, <laughs> but I still think, I still think the motorcycle would be the cheaper alternative. Um, I, I think that the car would probably make more sense in in certain situations. Mm. Uh, but I would say that if I had to choose, How dare you use the S word? <laughs> I, I I if I had to choose between only having a motorcycle or only having a car. I don't know. I'd probably be more on the fence. I mean, I think I think Ooh. I could say I think I could find a motorcycle to save more money. But I think there's a lot <laughs> yeah, of times yeah. we're like running to the yeah. hardware store and not having a pickup yeah. truck is is kind of a 100%. wild inconvenience. Yeah. yeah, that's why I think you just need to decide like what is your goal because if if you only have the goal of saving money, I think you can make the argument for motorcycles. But basically, if you have any goals, like literally any goals, <laughs> any other, other than, goals, <laughs> yeah, than just saving money, then then cars are especially if you're looking at used cars and and you're being really judicious with how you buy your cars. I think it it gets more complicated and you're probably going to end up getting a car. But whatever. Yeah. Well, there you have it, folks. Uh, are motorcycles the cheapest way to get around? We it's don't know, but you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, um, we got a, a few little housekeeping things that we got to tidy up here before we let the nice ladies and gentlemen go, Spencer. But thank you so much for your, your penny-saving wisdom and, uh, and your time in general hanging out with us. This was fun. Anytime, guys. <laughs> All right. See you next time. It is always great having Mr. Robert on the podcast. Indeed. He is a consummate professional, if not a frugal individual as well. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, a, he's a frugal fellow, and you can tell he enjoys uh, having conversations like that. And I'm glad we had his... Um Glad we had all his thoughts here. I think that I think it helped. I had fun with that conversation. I hope yeah. you all did too. Um, but now we're going to have a conversation with you about the, peanuts. The listener, fewer about, <laughs> about yeah. peanuts. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll take this one. I think because it's more of a, if it's a throw to you. Spurgeon. Yeah, I'm going to so let the, you take this one. The, just just so we're clear, for those of you that might be listening <laughs> to High Side Love Side for the first time, this is our comment section where we read your emails or your comments out loud. Mm -hmm. um, so make sure you shoot any emails that you have for Zach and I over to High Side Low Side at RevZilla.com, or you can leave them on the YouTube channel if you're watching on YouTube. Very well said, and good good intro to this section. I, I neglected that. And if you are listening to High Side Low Side for the first time, shame on you. My goodness. Mm. How did it take you this long? Anyway, uh, this email comes in uh, from Matthew, um, Matthew S. specifically. Uh, the subject was peanuts, and uh, Matthew says, This is an exceedingly small knit to pick, but in the Packing for Moto Trips episode, including Eric Henning, it seems like Spurgeon meant to say unshelled peanuts rather than shelled peanuts. And the reason that we're including this comment is that then we got into this whole thing about, like, if someone said, oh, I've got some shelled peanuts, would you be like, does that mean that the shells were taken off? Or if they are shelled, then they don't have peanuts. But if saying shelled kind of makes it sound like they've got shells on them, right? What did you say anyway? Did I you said shelled. I think I said shelled peanuts, and shelled <laughs> means that they've already had the shells removed. So what I want are unshelled peanuts, which means like in this case, shelled is being used as a verb, right? Like it's they, they they've been shelled uh, is what I think. Matthew thought I was saying 
what I was saying was I want peanuts with shells on them. So now, <laughs> for all the people that are confused with my peanuts comment about the snack that I like to enjoy on a motorcycle trip, I like peanuts that have shells intact, and I, I want to take the shells off. I want to on shell. No, that's not right. I want to want shell, shell the peanut. I want to shell the peanut myself, <laughs> and I want to put it in my mouth. Oh, it's so you, confusing. You want a snack activity, in other words. I appreciate that Matthew brought this up because it's confusing, and I it reminds me of the um, the Simpsons episode. With uh, for those of you who know the Simpsons, Doctor Nick, who's the sort of uh, ESL uh, surgeon doctor in town, who runs like the budget clinic, and one of his like tanks explodes, like one of the oxygen tanks, or something like that, in his emergency room. And there's a scene where like the cops or someone, a medic is like taking him out of the flaming building, and uh, the burning building, and he's saying something like "inflammable" means flammable. Who came up with this language or something like that? Which I mean, every time I see a tank of like whatever. Um, of of uh, compressed gas or something, and it says inflammable or something. And I think, I, like, good point. That's I think this is a good lesson because we do have a lot of international listeners, um, which is amazing to me all the time. But and the I English didn't mean language to make fun is of ex- accent. But no, no, I meant like the English language is extremely difficult to understand, <laughs> even for us that speak it as a first language. <laughs> so I hope that that clarifies anyone. Uh, uh, you, you, uh, the domestic or foreign that was listening to this episode, <laughs> being like, "What kind of sp- what kind of peanuts does Spurgeon like to eat?" Um, uh, and yeah, I like peanuts with shells on them. Okay. Um, yeah. So anyway, we can move on. But thank you for that we comment, can, Matthew. We can move on. the n- The next email comes in from Matt H, who says, "Hi, Chase." He wrote the he addressed the email to Chase, our producer, which is very smart, by the way. Um, since Chase is often the one who uh, is doing the legwork here. Matt H. says, just a quick note, uh, just a quick one on the last episode about packing tips for moto trips. Same same reference as the, the Peanuts episode uh, comment. <laughs> Matt says he was surprised no one mentioned <laughs> packing some spare fuses. They are tiny, cheap, and well worth having a few more spares on the bike than the bike would usually carry. Um, Matt says he's had a few breakdowns over the years on various bikes. Turns out it's a blown main fuse. Um, and subsequent really, subsequently realized that it didn't have a spare on the bike, and they're easy to pack. And I, to be honest, I'm surprised Ari Henning didn't bring this up. I'm surprised none of us did. I mean, Ari Henning is ah, obvi- the true. obvious choice, but is, um, yeah. <laughs> what I will say is that this is a great call-out from Matt H., um, not to be confused with Matthew S., uh, but <laughs> Matt H., the other thing that I want to point out here is while it is good to have spare fuses with you, typically fuses are blowing because of an underlying cause somewhere down the electrical chain oh, so it is okay. important yeah, true, to note true. that if you are blowing a fuse um and you're out on a motorcycle trip and you have a spare one with you not because we told you to do it but because you're smarter than us um it's i would say it's probably important to not take your last spare fuse just stick it in and start rolling away check your wiring connections see where nice. see where your issue is happening especially right. if you're on a road trip because you don't want to put that last fuse in make it another two miles down the road, and then the fuse blows again. Um, so so check and see where this might be an issue. Typically, and I've actually had this happen, um, it's usually uh, a worn through electrical cable on a frame rail somewhere that's touching. So you can usually kind of find that. And to Matthew's point, another good thing to keep with you would be some electrical tape. Because before you put that fuse in, you need to find the issue that's causing the fuse to blow. Typically, you can wrap a little bit of electrical tape around that, then put your fuse in and continue on your road trip. To Matt's point, not Matthew. It's confusing. Matthew. Is Sorry, <laughs> Matt. Anyway, the these are guy. great. These are great comments, uh, and we we so appreciate them. Uh, and if you have anything that you would like to tell us, or especially anything you'd like to tell our producer Chase, please do send an email to highsidelowside at revzilla.com or leave a comment below if you are watching on the YouTube's. Uh, and. If you'd like to win a T-shirt like Mid Coast Scrambler did, please do leave a podcast uh, or a review for our podcast on Apple Podcasts. Um, and if you uh, pander to us enough and promise us um, fame, riches, fortune, we might read your letter. Or I'm sorry, your podcast review on the air. In which case, you will get a free T-shirt. So that's going to wrap up episode nine of season five 
Uh, what I will say is Zach and I are working on a pretty special surprise for all of you for the season finale, which is only three short episodes away. Um, <laughs> and as always, we are going to have a, a listener's comments episode, which we always like to have fun with uh, as episode 11. So we have a lot of fun in the future for you. Make sure you are subscribing to High Side, Low Side, wherever you get your podcasts to keep up with the remainder of season five. And then before you know it, We'll be kicking off season six. So there's a lot of high side, low side action coming your way in the coming months. So if you are literally blowing fuses, we've covered that in this podcast. If you are figuratively blowing fuses because we're taking up too much of your time, the podcast is over. Thanks so much for hanging out, everybody. And we hope very much to see you here next time. Mm-hmm.